in charge of the, the community composting program that Prescott Farmers Market recently launched in partnership with the city of Prescott. Um, and today, my hope for this presentation um, is sort of to demystify uh, your anyone's backyard piles if you already have a compost pile going um, and, you, and you need some help troubleshooting it. And then for anyone who wants to start a pile, I, I hope to give you some tools and some confidence to uh, get one started um, in the near future. And so the, I'm gonna give a little bit, uh, a little basic compost one-on-one -on -one, uh, presentation. Um, and then we're gonna watch a, a short video of me in my garden at my backyard pile, just getting a new pile started where I'm gonna be talking about why I'm mixing what and how I'm doing it and all that. And so in the video is gonna sort of recap some of the points that I touch on in this presentation. So um, we'll talk, I'll, t I'll just briefly explain what compost is. I'll talk about what makes a good batch um, of compost, the right mix, the right recipe. Um, I'll talk about how to manage a compost pile um, without, you know, um, you know, just with basic tools in your backyard. And then um, I'll, I'll highlight some best management practices to avoid smelly odors and critters and things like that, that a lot of people tend to associate with compost. Um, so yeah, so what is compost? Com compost, it's not soil, it's not dirt, but it's a dirt-like substance that's nutrient rich and uh, is used in soil, like as a, to enrich soil in order to nourish plants. And um, it's, it's basically a soil conditioner. Um, so it's often you know, people t say, call it dirt or soil, but it's actually compost is its own thing and you add it to soil, um, which helps with water retention. Um, and it takes the place of any chemical fertilizers that you might be uh, feeding your garden. So you don't need to use chemical fertilizers. Compost is sufficient to grow healthy plants. Um, as composters, we are really just our, our goal is to create the ideal uh, habitat for an array of like a really diverse array of um, aerobic microorganisms that like decomposer microorganisms so there's there are microorganisms that require oxygen and that class of microorganisms doesn't emit the foul odors that we tend to associate with compost the anaerobic microbes um, emit methane and other uh, gases that smell real foul to us. So that's what happens in landfills. And um, when you think of compost and you think of rotten eggs or ammonia, that's because uh, the compost pile hasn't been managed closely. So we're going to address that today. Um, you know, a compost pile is sort of like having a pet is what I tell people. You have to, you know, it require a well-managed compost pile is it, it requires food, water, um, oxygen, and um, attention, you know, one and once in a while. So um, it's there, you can just let things go in the back corner of your, of your yard, and it eventually will turn to compost, but it's not going to be a hot compost pile. And that's okay too if you have the patience and the space for it. Like cold composting is a is its own thing and it has its own benefits, but um, you won't get the the temperatures necessary to kill pathogens like Salmonella and E. coli, and you won't kill uh, weed seeds um, and that sort of thing. But um, and because we're trying to process food scraps that we produce daily. We want a system that's going to create something valuable in a reasonable amount of time. So, you, if if you follow sort of best management practices of backyard composting, you can have two or three really amazing batches of compost in one growing season instead of waiting years for finished product. Um. So, uh, what makes a good compost mix? Let's. It's a. Uh, the food that microorganisms need is a mix of carbon rich materials and nitrogen rich materials. And the ratio that works the best is, um, as far as we're concerned, just one part 
nitrogen rich materials, which is food scraps, coffee grounds, um, weeds from the garden, whatever, plants from the garden that are chopped up. And then two parts carbon rich materials. So that could be leaves, wood chips, sawdust, shavings, straw, um, even hay, which tends to be really seedy. If it gets hot enough, all those seeds will be um, neutralized. They won't be viable anymore um, once it reaches certain temperature requirements. Um, and then it needs to be moist. Uh, it, the, the minimum moisture content of a compost pile is really 50%, which is a lot of water, but it's not, you know, it's, it's more water than most people think they need in a compost pile. And, but it's not like a, a dripping wet material, but it's a consist, it's a consistently moist material throughout the whole batch. So that's an important thing to consider when um, building a pile. And uh, again, in this video that we will show in a little while, um, I'll talk about all this while I'm building the pile and it'll make a little more sense what that looks like. Um, and then oxygen is a really, really important um, ingredient, I guess, in the in the compost mix and you can provide oxygen um, by manually turning the pile once in a while, especially in the first month or so of the pile's life. Um, you really wanna turn it once a week, which is, it's a lot of work and it it's, you know, it's, there's, there's no way around it. Like composting like this is, take some elbow grease, um, but it's a, it's a really empowering, you know, activity to build soil and, and all that and uh, reduce your waste and your trash bin will be less smelly and all that. Um, and so um, managing a compost pile, which I just started to touch on in terms of turning your pile, really uh, the, the most, the, the biggest challenge of backyard composting is um, is creating, accumulating enough material to even get to the conditions where things start to break down rapidly. You know, the conditions where it gets 131 degrees or hotter. Um, and so that's the trickiest part. And, you know, the, it's, it's really in everyone's best interest. This is what I tell anyone who asks me is to get your neighbors involved and get your friends involved because everybody eats and everyone creates food scraps, um, which could be food waste, but it's a resource that we're trying to keep here in Prescott in our backyards. And so you really need to accumulate um, at a minimum one cubic yard of material for these conditions to exist. So that's, you know, three feet by three feet by three feet. That's like one of those bins in like a common backyard bin system um, or a really big tumbler, but rarely do tumblers. Uh, have that capacity to get to those conditions, which is one problem with tumblers, but they have benefits as well. Um, so managing a pile, you basically, you add to a pile um, in the mix that I described, you know, one part greens, two parts browns, until you get to this uh, cubic yard. And that could take a month or it could take two months, or maybe um, you just like harvested you just cut down all your tomato plants and you chop them all up and then you have a yard of material when it's all mixed together. So it could happen in a day or it could happen over the course of time. But when you get to that uh, cubic yard, you stop adding to it and you treat it like a batch. And, and you know, the more you, if you add to it after that, you're delaying, um, you're delaying the process for it to be completed. So once you get to that cubic yard, then you, um, you need to monitor it. And the three things that I monitor for and that um, are, are temperature, moisture, and odor. And, you know, for temperature, you really do need a, te a thermometer. And there's, there's really good ones out there for 20 bucks that you can get on the internet. I couldn't find them locally. I tried. And, uh, but it really takes all the guessing out of it because, um, once you start to understand what's going on in the pile, the temperature is like a way for the pile to talk to you in a way. It's like the, it, you watch the temperature spike. And then when it starts to go down, the pile is saying, hey, we need more air. We need more air. And then you, that's, that's um, an indicator that you need to take action and turn it. And then while you're turning it, you, may, you can see if it's too dry, at which point you can add some more water. 
to get back to at least 50% moisture because the pile does dry out as it heats up and the moisture evaporates, which you'll see your pile steaming once it gets to this point. And then um, odor, if it, if it smells really bad and it's offensive and it's distracting, then uh, it might mean that the initial mix was a little bit off and you might've put too much, uh, too much food scraps or too much water. You know, if you put too much water in a pile saturated, then um, oxygen has a harder time circulating through the pile. And then the anaerobic, the really smelly bacteria takes over. So we wanna avoid that because we're talking about backyard, like urban composting where there's people around, you know, if we're out in the middle of nowhere with no neighbors, then you could do whatever you want and odor doesn't, isn't an issue, but um, we're talking about backyard, you know, we're, we're trying to keep, stay friends with our neighbors. Um, and so that's odor. So you need your nose, your, your hands to squeeze, to feel the moisture, and then a thermometer, thermometer. That's the, the three tools you need in addition to some pitchforks and shovels. Um, so that's kind of a, a quick management 101 and what to monitor for. So it's temperature, moisture, and odor. Those are the three big ones. And then as for um, avoiding critters and odors, which is, you know, those are the reasons that a lot of us might not want to compost is because we think we're going to attract, um, you know, pack rats and javelinas and and everything else that we don't want in the garden. And that being said, a note on javelinas, uh, unless your place is fenced in and javelina proof, you kind of need an, a closed bin system with tall sides. Um, you know, open pile wouldn't work just because we don't want to just have a javelina feeding zone. Um, and that being said, um, mice are sort of uh, to some degree inevitable like not, you know, not necessarily pack rats, but mice, because uh, it's not so much that they want to eat your scraps, but material that sits in one place for a long time becomes a really good habitat for mice, especially when it's really warm and the nights are cool. So no matter what, the best place for a compost pile is not right next to your garden, but somewhere close enough to the house where it's not an inconvenience to deal with it. But um, not so close uh, that you're going to be attracting mice where you don't want them. Um, but, you know, in my garden, there's mice in the, in the bin sometimes, and then I'll see a really fat garter snake. So it's all kind of takes care of itself eventually. But um, for critters, you know, if, if you really have a bad rat problem or something like that, there's ways to line your bins with hardware cloth um, to secure them a bit. And that does work to some degree. And there's a lot of um, resources on the internet and elsewhere where you can learn how to build bins. We're not going to talk about how to build bins today, um, but there's lots of options. Um, the odor issue, the, the big thing to consider is those anaerobic versus aerobic bacteria. Um, when aerobic um, bacteria that use oxygen, that breathe oxygen, take over the pile, it actually smells really earthy and pleasant, even in the initial decomposition where it could be really um, unpleasant. So aerobic bacteria are a good thing. Um, anaerobic bacteria uh, for our backyards are a bad thing because we won't want to go anywhere near the compost pile. So if it's too wet, it'll become anaerobic. And um, if it's too compacted, it'll become anaerobic. So there's ways to loft it up through manual turning and using wood chips in the initial batch and things like that. And then we have to control what we put into our piles. Um, in all of the systems that I manage, I, uh, here in Prescott, um, I don't accept meat or dairy or lots of oil, uh, things that go rancid, because um, it's not that those things don't break down in compost. Obviously they do. It's just that they smell really bad when they do. So we're gonna, we avoid those. And then, uh, so you kind of have to be in control of your inputs um, and, if you have neighbors contributing, you have to educate them and explain all this to them before you start accepting their, their stuff. Um, and then, you know, the, the key to, to odor also is like frequent aeration. And so you have to turn it once in a while. Um, and like I said, it's not easy, it's physical labor, but um, 
you know, it's, there's, there's tools, like there's these cool augers that you can get um, that don't require you to take all the material out of the bins. And there's kind of options out there. Um, tumblers work for that, but a really big tumbler can be hard to turn to. So, um, you know, you can have your neighbor help you turn the pile too. Um, so that's kind of like 101 in a nutshell, you know, what compost is, what makes a good batch, um, the ingredients. So it's, it's carbon rich materials, nitrogen rich materials, and then water and oxygen, and then um, how to manage it. And then some, uh, some just key points on managing critters and odors. And if you do all this and you, and you keep a close eye on it and you watch the temperature, you'll have really beautiful, dark, moist, finished compost that uh, you can sift out if you want to. It's not necessary, but if you have big wood chips in it, you might want to sift it out. You can, you know, you'll have it in like four to six months. I, four months is like a, a reasonable um, goal if you're really into it. And otherwise, you know, and after that, you can let it cure and it only gets better. So you can, you can manage these batches. And then when they get to that point, you can pull them out and just leave them in a pile under a tarp and just let them sit and cure for another month or two. And that will be really good. It'll be really good crumbly material that your garden will appreciate and your plants will appreciate, and then you'll appreciate. Um, and so, you know, there, there's some, I wanted to just mention as far as finished compost goes, it's really important not to put unfinished compost in your garden because um, it'll sort of conflict with uh, all the ecosystem in your garden in, in the soil already. You know, it ties up nutrients if the stuff is still breaking down. And uh, if there's like rotten stuff in there still, it'll attract critters right to your garden. So you really do wanna make sure that the compost is finished if it's finished, it'll look dark and crumbly, sort of like soil. It, it will not be hot anymore. It'll be very close to the ambient temperature. And that's another reason why a thermometer is important. And um, it'll smell nice. You won't be able to smell anything uh, smelly in it anymore. And then there won't be any visible food scraps except for like avocado pits that didn't get chopped up. Or, uh, you know, if you forgot to chop up, an orange when you first started the batch, you'll still have that orange. So that's another key point that I'll mention in the video as far as preparing your materials. Um, that being said, if an orange is chopped up, it does break down and you won't find it when it's done. So uh, I think that's everything for my little uh, 101. Um, I'm gonna do a Q&A after the video. And I just wanted to plug we put out a plug for our, our compost program. So at the market on Saturday, every Saturday, this time of the year at 7.30 to noon um, at the hospital, at uh, the parking lot across from the uh, hospital in Prescott, um, the Yavapai Regional Medical Center, we have a compost collection booth and that's where customers can bring their scraps to contribute to this system. And they can ask me a million questions if they want, if I'm not too busy. And you can learn about volunteering with the program. We always need volunteers at the booth on Saturdays. And then we also, on Sunday mornings, we build fresh piles on the site with everything that we collected at the market. And it's a fun way to interact with community members and learn about compost like in a very hands-on way. Um, that being said, it's way cooler to make it in your backyard. And I always try to keep a pile fired up in my garden because it's it feels really good to just have to watch it all unfold in your backyard and the food scraps that you produce really never leave, you know, your property, which is really cool. Um, so I think that's that. We'll, we can turn it on. We, we can turn on the video, Ruthie, if uh, you want. Okay. And then uh, we'll, we'll come back and folks are welcome to ask me any questions they want and I'll try to, my best to answer them. ingredients we're using today to build this compost pile are uh, leaves, bagged leaves. These happen to be cottonwood leaves, but any leaves will do. Um, we have food scraps, kitchen scraps, that are no more than two weeks old. We want fresh scraps in our pile. And these are from my neighbor and a couple friends who keep their scraps collected in a bucket over the course of a week and then 
they give them to me and that's when I add to the pile. So I'm not adding to the pile during the week, I just add you know, once a week, maybe every other week, depending on how many, how many, uh, how many scraps I'm accumulating. Um, today we're going to build a fresh pile in this empty bin on the far right. This, this bin, this, this system allows us to remove these inserts so that we can turn the piles easily, but it's not necessary. Um, the, the tools that we need today for this compost build is uh, a flat shovel that's relatively sharp so that we can chop up any big scraps. We don't want anything whole. Um, we need a pitchfork to mix the scraps with the browns, with the other ingredients before we pile it. And then we need a hose or some sort of access to water because water is one of the most important ingredients in any compost pile. Um, Today, the rest of our ingredients is, are going to be wood chips, which provide aeration to the pile. Uh, we have a little bit of chicken manure in this bag that we're going to add. That's um, a boost of nitrogen for the pile, which is one of the key ingredients. And then um, we'll be mixing approximately two parts carbon-rich materials or browns and one part greens, which is high in nitrogen. So it's one part food scraps to one part group. Uh, leaves in this case and then one part wood chips and then we'll mix and pile it in our, our bin and then it'll, it'll get cooking. So this initial mixing and preparation step can be done in a wheelbarrow but today I'm just going to do it right in front of the bins. Um, so I'm basically going to use this area as a, a working area and then we're going to pile in the bins and then I'll just rake anything that's left over into the pile. But if you want to make less of a mess you can do it in a wheelbarrow first and then pile it in. So we'll start by putting some fresh chips down. dump our buckets of greens. That one had some charcoal in it. I try to avoid charcoal, but a little bit's okay. Weeds from the garden, eggshells, brown paper bags, greens, greens, all are okay. We avoid meat and dairy because I want my neighbor to stay my friend. And meat and dairy smell really bad when they break down. And they're a challenging uh, feedstock to deal with. And then... Okay, I'm not gonna lie, this is from the sandwich shop. This is not from one of my friends. They don't eat that much cabbage. Shout out to Nick's Feed Your Face. And then we'll add the, the chicken poo. That'll be considered a green as well because it's high in nitrogen. greens. Um, we're going to make sure there's no whole whole vegetables or big pieces. And this is also a good chance to grab any trash that managed to get into the system, into the buckets. So we just take a few minutes to chop any really big pieces. We don't have to mince it because we want diversity in the particle size. Big pieces are okay, just nothing whole. 
And if we have big chunks here and there, it provides air pockets and we need air in this paw. If everything was minced, it would all be compacted really fast and then it would be anaerobic and smelly, meaning oxygen would not be able to penetrate the pile or move through the pile. Since this pile is going to be turned within a week, um, I'm not going to go too crazy because I can always chop things up the next time I um, dig in. All right, there's our, our greens. And then, so we're going to add, let's see, how many buckets do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six buckets. Um, so we're going to add about six buckets of leaves. But this doesn't have to be an exact science, so we're just going to dump the whole bag. We'll call that six. And now we have... The leaves, the most important ingredient in this whole mix is water. So, in an ideal world, I'd use rainwater, but all of my barrels are dry, they're empty, so I'm using the city water. And so, I'm going to start watering, and then once it's got uh, a good deal of moisture in it. I'm going to start mixing and what you want to think about when you're adding moisture to your pile is you want everything to be coated in a thin film of water because the microbes that break down the material they live in that thin film that surrounds each particle. So they don't live in the food scraps and they don't live in the free air space in between them. They live in the water that surrounds them. So if you have dry material nothing's happening. And then once we water, so this is all the preparation step, and then we're going to mix, and then we're going to add it to the bin. Once we add some water, then we're going to take our pitchfork, mix it. We're going to try to get the chips that we put down first mixed in as well. And at this stage, there's no um, really noticeable odor because all of these scraps are fresh. So the breakdown hasn't begun yet. And then we're going to add some more wood chips, which provides um, a bulkiness to the pile that allows oxygen to pass through. We're going to catch trash as we come across it. You might wonder why is he adding wood chips? Wood chips don't break down that fast. But the wood chips will be sifted out with our screens at the end. Um, but for now, they're an important part of the process because they, again, they allow that bulkiness, the porosity to the pile, which is necessary. Since all of this is really dry, I'm going to water it. And while we're watering that, we'll water the hops too. So we're going to mix the material until it's as homogeneous as possible and until it seems that the whole mix is moist. So we're going to do this and water until there's no dry spots. And then we just pile it into the bins. And this is the same process 
that you would do uh, if you had open piles or even if you had a big tumbler you could mix it first and then add because the tumbling action doesn't inc you know homogenize the mix as well as we would like to um, and then once you if you do this once a week or once every two weeks when you have these buckets available and filled with food scraps it will only take maybe a month to, to get to the volume necessary for the pile to start cooking and then it'll break down rapidly and turn into compost so here's the pile that we just built it's about one part food scraps one part wood chips and one part leaves uh, we built it in front of the pile and then we raked everything including the existing chips into the pile and then we'll just lay fresh chips back down to absorb any excess moisture and to keep the place nice and tidy. Um, you can tell that it's, it looks like it's mostly browns and that's because it is. Remember that you don't want too much nitrogen. This, is, this pile will never become um, an odor issue because the balance is correct from the get-go. Um, if we put too much nitrogen, that's when you get really foul odors that piss off neighbors and, um, you know, make people not want to go through the effort of composting in their backyard. And now we're going to do the final step of the compost build process, which is one of the most important steps. And that is uh, we're going to cap it. We're going to cover the pile with um, about six inches of more mature compost. That's from a, a previous pile. Um, you can also use wood chips or leaves or straw. If you're going to use leaves or straw, you, you want to shoot for about a foot of material. And that will insulate the pile. It will keep um, fresh food scraps uh, contained so that they're not interesting to critters. And it will suppress any odors that start to be emitted from the pile. So it's a really important step, this, this final cap or seal. Um, and in this case, we have um, some sifted out material. So these are what we call uh, overs. It's like wood chips that are partially composted. Um, and then we have a pile here that um, is what's left of an older pile. It's, it's actually it's not quite finished. It's still um, slightly active, but it's towards it's it's curing. So it's not finished compost, but it's not. Um, odorous or it's it's not uh it smells earthy it's and it and it contains odor really well so what we're gonna do is find a shovel and we're gonna just cover our brand new pile with a layer of more mature material and we're gonna throw these overs into and you really never want to see your food scraps when you go and check on your pile. If you can see your food scraps, you're, you should be sure that the pack rats have also found your food scraps. And that's something we want to avoid. One or two more scoops, and that will be enough for now. And there's the start of a brand new compost pile. Um, this isn't enough material to get quite to the thermophilic conditions or the really hot conditions that we want it to get to, but if we do this same process, again next week or in two weeks that will be a full batch and at that point I would stop adding to this pile 
and I would uh, just maintain it and manage it as a, its own batch and turn it weekly until it stops um, until it stops spiking in temperature. And on that note, if you're going to manage a system like this, you need to get a thermometer to take the guessing out. Um, you know, it's, it's really a guessing game without it. And uh, if you're going to be monitoring the odor and the moisture and the temperature, you need a thermometer, you need your nose, and you need to be able to feel the material. So those are the three tools you need to manage it. Um, and you want to keep the moisture uh, at least 50% throughout the entire process, which means that the material should stick together. Um, and I could show you an example of that. Um, so this is that more mature stuff. I'm going to squeeze it together. And it's not dripping, but it holds together. And so that is about 50% moisture, and that is a minimum. So that's what we want. If it falls apart, you need to add water. And I highly recommend adding water while you're turning and not after you're turning because you don't want to fill in the air pockets that you just spent all this this time and energy creating so you want to water your pile uh, before you turn it or during turning it but not once you've piled it up um, and that's how to build uh, a backyard compost pile with a with a multi-bin system such as this um, it's really rewarding. It's good exercise. It's empowering to build your soil for your, you know, to to feed the garden that feeds you, um, and it's a really good way to reduce the the food waste and and uh, the trash that we send to the landfills. Thanks for that, Gabriel. Um, yeah, no problem. So we do have um, some questions here. Um, somebody says, I am struck by how communal this process can be. What is the most surprising aspect of the local response to Prescott Farmers Market and the community composting program? Um, uh, I think the, I've been most surprised by, um, the amount of folks who aren't necessarily gardeners or or even you know people who aren't interested in the finished compost but rather just uh folks who want to reduce the amount of food scraps that they send to landfills and just di didn't have um kind of a way to do that or the the knowledge to do that yet so when we launched our community composting program and um we had all this surge of enthusiasm and interest and support from the community members. Um, the the thing I was surprised about the most was that a lot of folks just um, just want to waste less and and feel bad throwing it out. And this was finally an outlet, and so that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, and then is the looks like, looks like Steve Walker has his hand raised. Could we let him ask a question real quick? Um. Yeah, here we go. All right, Steve, I think you, you should be able to talk now. If you unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yeah, what's up, Steve? Okay, hey, that was an excellent demonstration. Your garden looks fantastic. In your, in your bins, what do you put on the bottom to keep tree roots from growing up in it? You know, I haven't, so I haven't had an issue, but I've heard of folks who have their bins next to like cottonwoods um, and elms seem to, or, or next to elms specifically, not cottonwoods. Elms like to just shoot their shoots up into the bins and that causes problems. But I, I never put anything. I just put it down on the native soil that was already there. And that there's a, a really beautiful apricot tree next to the bin. And it hasn't, I haven't even encountered any, roots of any kind and rather the tree has seemed to respond really well to being next door to uh, a compost <laughs> bin like it's very lush this year and and uh i think some of that has to do with with the pile being right there and i water the pile all the time so the tree's getting watered all the time so i haven't it, experienced it, the problem yet it wouldn't hurt to put down like uh one foot 
pavers or something yeah. on the bottom? Yeah, I, I built another system elsewhere in town uh, that looks similar. It's a little bigger. Um, and I put pavers down and I prefer that actually because it makes it easier to scoop the material and you're not digging into the soil. And so if you have a bunch of pavers or don't mind spending some money on some pavers, I actually think that's a really good practice. And it'll also help prevent, you know, critters from tunneling up from beneath, which right. I have experienced. Um, and, you know, when I tell people to, when I recommend doing that, folks are like, but what about the worms? And the worms will make, they'll find their way into the pile when the time is right, no matter what, even if it's on concrete. Um, yeah. And so when the pile's curing and, and finishing and moist, the worms like that environment and they'll make their way in from wherever they're at. So papers are a good idea for like long-term. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I do have elm trees. Yeah, they're problematic. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, okay, so somebody else asks, what is the two to one um, ratio? Is it by volume or is it by weight? It's, uh, I measure it by volume. And, and it's really just something we're striving for. Like, I don't measure it out uh, super diligently, but, um, but I do my best. And, and it's, uh, it's just something to shoot for, but it's by volume. Yeah. And what about adding soil microorganisms with a couple of shovels full of existing guarding soil? Yeah, that's, um, that's a great idea. It's like, if you can inoculate your fresh batch with some sort of um, my, microbial like life already, some microbial activity, then um, you're just given the pile a kickstart. Like I'll, um, I almost always incorporate some sort, some finished, at least finished compost or partially finished compost that's active because it's like, it's kind of like a sourdough starter. It like kickstarts the whole process. And, um, inoculates it yeah all right thank you um and then thank you someone says thank you very much for your presentation i'm reassured that i've been doing things right including using my chicken and goat manure i love worms what happens to my worms when the pile heats up um they leave or die worms don't can't really tolerate high high temperatures so they do have a part in the process, in the compost process, but it doesn't come until later on when the, when the pile is maturing and the temperature isn't getting really hot anymore. You know, worms really don't like anything over 100 degrees. Like they, you know, 50 to set, they're kind of like us, 50 to 70 is their preference. So they like cured, they'll like finish it off is the way I think about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh pj says hey and as you remember i have a lot of scrub oak bushes can those tiny and thorny leaves be used um they can but um, my understanding with oak leaves like i treat oak leaves like pine needles they're really acidic and they it's not so much that they'll throw the balance of the compost off in terms of acidity because it'll all be balanced out eventually but they just don't break down very fast so um, with like pine needles, if you throw a huge uh, a bag of pine needles in, you're going to have pine needles in your otherwise finished compost. So I try to avoid large amounts of pine needles and I treat oak leaves uh, the same. So I don't really, I try not to accept like bags of oak, oak leaves if people are offering leaves for the program and that sort of thing. Um, good question, DJ. Yeah. Um, okay. And then what is the right temperature we are looking for? And should we wait at least a week before dispersing into our garden? Yeah. So the sweet spot, different, different parts of the compost process, um, at, during different parts of the process, the pile will be at different temperatures. So in the first month or two, when it's, um, in its thermophilic stage, which is 131 to about 160 degrees, during that stage, that's when the, the microorganisms are like reproducing like crazy. And that's why you're seeing the spike in temperature and the temperature is like a product. It's a result of the, the breakdown that, um, that the microbes are doing. And uh, 
you really, so the whole process will take at least four months that you should know. And then, so like, I wouldn't consider putting anything on your garden until it's absolutely finished, which is going to be at least four months from when you say, okay, that's a batch. I'm going to stop adding to it. Um, at, but once the temperature is stable and it's close to the, the ambient temperature and you, there's no visible food scraps anymore, then you can sift it and put it in your garden anytime. And you can wait and let it cure longer if you want, but you can just put it right in the garden and it'll sort of finish off and cure in, in the garden beds as well. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I hope that answers the question. And then this one says, I'm one of those community members that primarily wants to reduce the amount of food scraps, et cetera, going into the landfill. Awesome. Um, you said in the video that the food scraps should be no more than two weeks old. Sometimes I don't get my scraps to the farmer's market every Saturday. So are each Saturday collection used for a new start every week, or do I really need to get my food scraps to the market every week? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. The the reason I, I say no more than two weeks is, be, first of all, yes, we create a new batch every week. And we've been, for the last six weeks, we process about uh, 1,000 to 1,200 pounds of food scraps every Sunday morning. And that's mostly collected from the Saturday market. And then there's a few restaurants. But um, the main reason I don't want old food scraps is because the, it's an urban composting project and in the site and there's residents that live nearby and uh, odor is one of the really like kind of delicate topics in urban community composting and old food scraps, like three week old food scraps, they smell bad. And they're like, no one disagrees with that really. Like you open your bucket and you're like repulsed. So we're trying to avoid that. And that's why I'm requesting like fresh food scraps. And that's why I ask people not to seal their buckets until they're transporting them because if you leave a bucket sealed and then go on a trip for a week and then come back, that bucket is now anaerobic and really, really sort of like repulsive. And, you know, if, if, if volunteers who come on the site are repulsed by it, they might not want to come back. And it's really just best practice to get fresh, fresh scraps in the pile as soon as possible. But every two weeks is okay though. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that's all the questions I see. I see one in the chat box. Um, what are your thoughts on freezing food scraps prior to composting to oh, avoid odor? That's my favorite thing ever. I think everyone should do that. If they had enough freezer space. Yeah, that's like best practice. I, I like thank anyone who brings me frozen food scraps. But I also understand like freezers fill up with edible food too. So, yeah. All right. Um, I'm not seeing any more. Let's see, check one more time. I I just do want to uh, follow up with uh, Kathleen Williams and then Kathleen Getman's response. If if we turn it that initial time and there's still visible food scraps um, and there's odor, I still would cap it again. Um, ideally, that second time I would try to cap it with like mature compost or soil. But um, if you don't have that, then it's, it's better to like just add some more wood chips and then sift them out later than to deal with like an odorous pile. So sometimes um, it needs to be capped more than once. That's a good question though, because yeah. Okay, just one more question from Katie Baird. She says, I've read different approaches regarding when to work your finished compost in. Some say fall as a conditioner to prep your soil for the following spring. Others say during the active growing season as a fertilizer in solid or tea form, what are your thoughts? All of the above <laughs> is my answer, yeah. I use compost uh, at, when I transplant anything really, I'll throw a handful of compost in the hole. Um, in the winter or fall, I'll like put a nice inch over every bed and then mulch it and just let it rest for the winter or uh, if you're not like cover cropping or something. And then um, during the season, you can use it as a mulch too. like uh, around the base of plants or top dressing. So it really doesn't hurt. And you know, the, the nutrients are released over a, a kind of a long time period. So there's no worry of like burning plants or anything like that. Um, that being said, 
some things don't like to get started, like seeds don't like to get started directly in compost, um, but some things do. So uh, it kind of is just, yeah, all of the above, Katie, <laughs> depending on how much you have. <laughs> Cool. Okay. And I want to I want to invite anyone to come to the market and chat me up too um, with with any follow ups and maybe we can make that video available I, in another form because it's a little choppy even. Um, yeah, sorry. It, it no, that's okay. Uh, it's not choppy for me. So the video itself is not choppy. So I think it's just the yeah. transmitting it over Zoom yeah. part. So yeah, yeah. We, uh, we will put it on the Prescott Public um libraries seed library um webpage and it so we do have a seed library if you didn't know free seeds to come and uh take home um so yeah we'll get it up on that seed library webpage um and it won't be choppy because it i'm, I'm sorry i did not um, yeah it wasn't it's not actually yeah. choppy it's just the internet and how it comes through um so if people want to watch that again um or let, you know, let other people know, um, it'll be up there, um, early next week. Cool. Yeah, thanks cool. So much. yeah. And if it ends up the recording is choppy, we'll, we'll post that just that, uh, video somewhere too. So we can watch people can reference it too. I would also love yeah. to invite people to the garden to start piles with me too. And we can just do that. I mean, that's basically what we do on the compost site every Sunday on a, on a slightly bigger scale. So like if people want to participate in that, um, hands on, that's another opportunity. Gabe, you've got one more question. Um, yeah, uh, to, to answer a question, yes, the entire recording will also be posted. And then if, if it's not, if the video is choppy, we'll also post the other video. So you can just watch the video. Uh, the question was, I'm building a compost holder from scratch. Is it best to build a solid side with pavers bottom? Secondly, I only have one area which is fenced off from the deer. I was going to put the compost in that area behind the fence, but per your comment, the mice might be a problem. Should I put it separate? Um, so to answer your, the first question for solid sides and paver bottom, um, in like, I always encourage people if they're just getting started, like go get free pallets, like free is the best way to do it. Um, that pile in the garden, in the video, like I paid eight bucks for screws and the rest is free. But, um, in Arizona, since it's so dry, uh, the piles, the moisture becomes really hard to manage in open sided bins like pallets. Uh, so using lumber for closed sides is actually, it works really well here, I've found. Um, where else, you know, other, other places in the country, it conflicts with aeration too much and that sort of thing, or it gets too moist. But here, um, closed sides holds the moisture in really well. And that's kind of the, what I would recommend. And then if you have the pavers or are or, or willing to buy them, then pavers on the bottom, um, makes it easier to manage. Um, and then as far as deer go, if you cap your pile um, and you turn it frequently and all that, like deer are not gonna, you know, dig through a six or 12 inch cap to get to 140 degree material, you know, to munch on. So I don't think even if it was outside the fence, I don't think deer would actually be an issue unless you missed some food scraps when you were building the pile which is another point, which is like, you have to really keep it tidy and, and take the time to pick up anything that got away from you when you build your pile, because even like one like piece of a potato that rolls away is going to attract critters. Um, so being like really neat and sort of, uh, uh, yeah, just paying attention to that is really important. Um, and then the mice thing, you know, like I said, so my about material sitting in one place is what mice are attracted to. So if you're turning your pile every week, you actually won't, mice don't want to inhabit a place that's constantly being messed with. So if you're, if you're trafficking your pile a lot and checking on it and then moving the material around and the browns and leaves and straw and stuff too, like even just fl fluffing that up with a pitchfork once in a while will keep the mice populations um, away. And I've noticed that they're not really an issue in my piles until I like, um, like when we launched the on-site program, I stopped using my compost bins for like a month or two. And 
at that point, all of a sudden there were mice everywhere. And before that, I hadn't noticed that. So that was because it was sort of neglected. And now that there's like a pile fired up in there again, it's not an issue. And also at the snakes, like there's a ton of garter snakes in my garden, which is a, a good thing. Um, I hope that answers your questions. But uh, yeah, not next to the garden. That's the main thing, like right next to the garden, you know, on the other side of the, the yard which is what I'd recommend. Okay, and I don't think we got to this one, um, and this will be the last um, question, but is there a local source for wood chips, like kind of free? Um, yeah, so you can go to the dump and get free chips. Well, it's actually mulch, it's like finer, and sometimes I think they might run it through the system twice, so it's really fine and shredded material from the dump, which you can get for free. I think Monday through Thursday, they have hours where you can pick it up. That being said, that's like everyone's yard way. So there's often trash and stuff and you can't really control what is in there. But I just flag down arborists all the time and get their number and explain to them what I'm doing. And often um, these arborists around town are gonna go to the dump anyway with their load of wood chips. So if they can just stop at your place and dump a load of wood chips, then it's, you know, you're killing two birds with one stone. And so, and then, and then from arborists, it's really clean because it just is a down tree that just ran through the chipper. And that being said, I would, I shoot for dead wood that's deciduous, it, deciduous. If I can uh, have my choice, rather than like a fresh pine tree that was cut down, um, it's just like dead stuff will break down a little bit faster, and um, it's closer to being pure, pure carbon um, at that point. Yeah, arborists are the way to go. All right, thank you so much, Gabriel. And um, thank yeah, you for um, tuning in and look for the um, presentation posted on our website next week. And then there's that, the one resource, that, did we get that link up somewhere for the Institute for Local Self-Reliance? They have a really good yeah. composting um, uh, document that I, I think is super helpful. And I encourage people to read it. So if we can... Um, even if we'll have it on, on the library's website, that's sufficient probably, but just so yeah. folks know. Um, yeah, it was posted earlier in the chat, but there it is again. And um, here's for the web, web page. And yeah, I'll, I'll post that. And there's some other um, resources posted on that um, library web page too. Cool. Thanks so much, Ruthie, for facilitating that. Of course. Yeah. Okay, have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.